So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about um, XLAPS, um, just to give you a, a you know rough idea of how we do things and, and potentially how you could do things even at, potentially a little bit better, but also just to make it a little bit easier for you as well. Uh, so what we're going to go through tonight, so we're going to go through when to cut, so look at uh, indications, um, what to do beforehand as well. Um, surgical approach, I think most of us are fairly familiar with how to do an X-LAP, but just try and give you a few tips and tricks that we use to make their lives a little bit easier. Uh, instrumentation, again, same sort of thing, just going through instruments that, that we tend to use to make visualizations easier um, and that, that may help you in your clinic. The technique, how we do the explore, how we close the abdomen, um, and then spe specific techniques. I've got, there's a couple of things that I want to go through towards the end if we have time. Um, just more things that I found really interesting when I started in referral practice. It's not, nothing super fancy, um, but hopefully helpful. Um, so, so an X lap. So I'm sure just about every one of us has done. Oh God knows how many X laps over the years for various reasons, whether it's foreign bodies or um, tumors, splenectomies, all sorts. Uh, so when do we cut? So indications. Um, Probably the main ones, probably at the bottom, I mean treatments are probably the main ones that we do these for and intestinal foreign bodies are probably the, the, the I guess, the main one. Um, neoplastic lesions, so the classic heme abdomen, five o'clock on a Friday afternoon, a dog rolls in with a heme abdomen that's got a, needs a splenectomy. But these days I guess you'd normally just send it on to the emergency centre, but didn't have that luxury when I was in your grad. Um, septic abdomens and obviously um, urolits and things like that as well. We can definitely also use Celiotomies as diagnostic tools. Um, we tend to use them quite a lot, typically for our medicine team. So using them for, for liver biopsies, intestinal biopsies, and all that sort of stuff. So when we look at pre-surgery, I guess the things that we need to do before we look at cutting a dog, um, and I think the most important thing is, is trying to make sure that this dog is stable and a good candidate for both the anaesthetic and the surgery itself. Um, so obviously, Things like blood tests, blood gases, CBCs, that sort of stuff is important, um, but I think tonight we'll probably, probably try and focus more on the imaging side of things because I think as surgeons we probably know more about that than the medicine stuff. Um, so the first one is abdominal radiographs. Um, I think we probably, we in referral practice probably underutilize this a little bit because we've got access to CTs and abdominal ultrasound and, and people that can use the abdominal ultrasound really quite well, not like us. Um, but I think it is, it is a really important modality, um, especially for things like foreign bodies and, 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 and neoplastic lesions as well. Um, very important when you're looking at radiographs to make sure you look at the whole thing, exactly like we were taught at uni, have a very systematic approach, make sure you're assessing every single structure within the abdomen um, or everything that you can see as well. Looking at your serosal detail, whether, there's, whether there is good serosal detail or not, whether there's air or fluid in the abdomen. Um, you can also do things like assessing your liver size with your gastric axis as well. Like you, realistically, your, your gastric axis should be following your your ribs, your normal size liver. And um, you can see in dogs with either microhepatica or with liver enlargement and tumors that will change your gastric axis sometimes as well. Um, although this is interesting, this is a case that we had last week um, that was a, a dog that had presented with um, hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, and it was quite unwell. Um, this dog actually had a colonic torsion, which you can see the very large colon coming through here and the patterns of obstruction through the rest of the intestine. So it's an odd one because it wasn't quite the classic colonic torsion presenting like it's going to die if you don't cut it within the next half an hour. Um, this dog ended up getting cut the next day because we weren't quite sure what was going on with it and it had tors and untorsed a couple of times. So it did need some uh, bowel resection, but it's going well at this point. Um, I think the next slides, so this is uh, another way that we can use abdominal radiographs. So we've actually done, this is the same case, and we've done a, a barium enema. Um, so you can actually see on both radiographs as the contrast enters the, the colon, you start to lose it through here, you lose it through here as well, and that's actually where the colon was partially twisted and obstructing. Um, so yeah, we went in, I think that was last Friday and resected that part of the colon. I think the dog's doing well. So the next one's ultrasound. Um, 
don't think I'll harp on about this for too long because I don't know a lot about it, to be honest. Um, I know that we can use it to diagnose a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, it's probably the mode of choice for intestinal foreign bodies these days, as long as you've got a, a half-decent machine and a good ultrasonographer, I think, which I never was. Um, but we also use it for gallbladder mucoseals, near pleasure, especially splenectomies, hemaptomies, things like that. Um, this one that I've got on the screen is another one from the last week or so. Um, this dog had a, has a gallbladder mucoseal. It's not the classic appearance, but you can sort of make out the sort of star-shaped stellate appearance in the middle of the gallbladder, which is normally a diagnostic thing to see. And moving on to something that may not be as familiar with, um, but CT scans. Um, so we, we obviously use, we use this quite a bit, and we use it a lot, especially for metastatic screening for pretty much any tumour that we have. Um, it's a lot more sensitive, especially in the thorax, it's a lot more sensitive than radiographs. Um, and the other benefit to it, as you can see on this one, is we use, we use a lot of IHEXL or IV contrast in these cases as well. Um, this CT in particular was um, a little, I think an 18 month old dog that we were looking for a liver shunt. Um, I don't have a picture of the liver shunt, but you can see that it was in aorta running the whole way down. You can see how bright the contrast shines when, once you enter the, once it enters the system. And this is just another, I thought an interesting one from last weekend that was a, a dog with a pharyngeal stick injury. And you can actually see, so the green arrows through there, this dog actually had, the dog had quite a severe esophageal laceration. Um, it had emphysema and it also had a pneumomediastinum, which is these green arrows, even extending right back into the retroperitoneum. So it actually had a pneumoretroperitoneum, um, which we didn't, don't really have to do too much about. This dog, we, we ran in and, and um, had a large abscess in its neck that we fixed and then fixed its esophageal laceration. Dog's doing well, so that's another, another good one. But I thought that was an interesting one. I've, I don't think I've ever seen a pneumoretroperitoneum from a sort of a neck or a pharyngeal wound like this, so I thought that was pretty interesting. So fluid analysis, and again, I think this probably goes hand in hand with your abdominal ultrasound as well, because most of your fluid collection is going to be ultrasound guided. Um, Selling the difference between what fluids are what, I think, is super important with these. So, obviously, your main ones from the textbook change, you know, telling the difference between a transudate, modified transudate, and exudate um, is super important. And then, uh, I guess, your other ones trying to figure out further. So, potentially, if you're worried about your abdomen, using your creatin creatinine ratios between the abdominal fluid and the blood um, is always helpful. Um, and one thing that we, we use quite often is um, cytology. So obviously you're looking for intracellular bacteria if you've got a septic abdomen. Um, we also tend to use the glucose and lactate differentials as well. So if you've got a um, blood to fluid glucose difference of more than about 1.1, then that's diagnostic for a septic abdomen. Um, and same with lactate. If the difference is uh, less than two between blood and the abdominal fluid, then that's diagnostic as well. So those dogs, we would absolutely take to surgery. Um, with septic abdomens, um, almost 100% of septic abdomens need surgery. There's not many that will survive without it. And I think even with it, it's sort of, I think, about a 50% mortality rate. So never a, a fantastic chance, but um, never quite know what it is until you get in there. So probably the last bit on when to cut is decisions on whether to cut or stabilise the patients first. Um, this picture is just, this one's just out of the textbook. Um, showing a splenic mass, you can see the large mass in the middle of the abdomen, and you can see that you've lost a little bit of cerosal detail in there because you've lost, you've actually got this dog's got a heme abdomen. I think in in most cases of heme abdomen, I, I I think that it is rare to see one that's actively bleeding. Most of the time, by the time that they present to us, they bled as much as they're going to. Their PCV may drop, but it's it's a it's a relative change rather than an ongoing change. So I don't think in those cases, if, if you've got a patient that is destabilising, having trouble breathing and pale, I think you're better off stabilising and potentially transfusing that patient rather than taking it to surgery straight away. I know there's the thought that if you're putting blood into a dog that's bleeding, you're potentially going to just be just pouring that blood into the abdomen. And I think in some cases you might be right, but I think in the majority of cases we would want to stabilise this patient first because you take it to surgery and it passes away under anaesthetic, then it's not going to have helped anyone. Um, but it's de definitely a case by case, but I'd say as a um, general rule, I think we tend to stabilise ours first. Does anyone have any questions so far? All good. 
So I'll move on to instrumentation. Um, so these are just some of the instruments that we would use um, in an exploratory laparotomy, um, which we'll go through in a bit more detail. So self-retaining self -retaining retractors, so either the Balfours or Gelpie retractors, we tend to use our Balfours a lot, for, especially for smaller dogs. Um, it tends to give you really good visualisation, especially the cranial abdomen in areas that are quite difficult to see in. Um, if this video wants to work. So this is one of our surgeons, Dr. Cray, and our intern, Justin, um, just showing sort of the application of the Balfour retractors. Um, so you can see these, these are designed for, most of the time they're designed for human use. So the sizing is always a little bit funny. Most of the time, even in smaller dogs, you'll be using at least medium Balfours. Um, the spoon that Craig's about to attach, that sort of fi fixes on there by a little bolt, it's not as helpful when it's attached like that. The, because it's designed for humans, uh, most of the time you'll find that it doesn't actually give you the visualisation that you need. And the way that you need, we typically use it is have, don't have it attached, have our assistant actually pulling on that in sort of a cranial and a ventral, so an upward sort of direction. And then that gives you a visualisation to look at your diaphragm and your liver and your cranial abdomen. Uh, but that's one that gets used on pretty much every single abdomen that we do. I think it, it makes a massive difference, especially the cranial abdomen. Um, Gelpies, you can definitely use in smaller dogs. Obviously, they only have limited amount of retraction, but in smaller dogs that you can't get a belt, a Balfour to fit on, then you definitely can just use a Gelpie sort of cranially and quarterly, and that'll definitely help your visualization as well. Electrocautery. Um, so it's a couple of different types of electrocautery. Um, the most common one, I think, that most, I would hope, maybe most practices have, um, is going to be these units here. So either your bipolar or your monopolar. So they definitely work very differently between the two. Um, so your your monopolar basically works with a, as most of you probably know, with a, a plate, and the current basically goes through the patient through the plate, and then the, the current is, the circuit is completed that way. Um, and both of these are just used to basically heat the tissues to um, help to coagulate vessels and stop hemorrhage. Sorry. And then your, your bipolar, basically the current just passes between the tips of the instrument. So it's used a lot more for a lot finer tissue use if we're close to things that we're worried about, like spinal cord or the heart and things like that, where we don't want electrical current passing through, then we'll typically use the, um, the bipolar ones. One tip that I would say is there's various different ways that you can use the monopolar. Um, so obviously the, the, the main one that most people will use is just direct contact. So direct contact with the, the coagulation button to try and seal those vessels. Um, probably the better way um, and the, the, the way to get, a, I guess, a better seal on those vessels is to use it on your instruments. So actually have a pair of forceps adsens or something similar grasp the vessel and make sure that that's stopping the bleeding and then apply the cautery to that metal instrument and then that will that will cauterize the vessel a lot uh, tighter and have a much better seal than if it's just directly applied and it also results in a little bit less sort of damage to the t collateral damage to the tissues I guess as well. So the next slide um, and we've got a couple of units up here if anyone does want to have a look um, but the Ligershaw is another form of electrocautery. Um, this machine that I've got here basically uses, uh, you can use it on either. These are the ones we use in our clinic. So these ones you've either got a, a bipolar or a monopolar or a Ligershaw attachment there. Now, the other thing to mention for, actually I forgot to mention, sorry, for your normal electrocautery, you probably shouldn't be using that on vessels anywhere over about two millimetres in diameter because you won't get a good seal. And inevitably, especially once the blood pressure comes up after surgery, you will get some ooze or hemorrhage from that vessel. These ones are very, very helpful because these ones, both units are the same with regards to how big you can go, but these will do vessels up to about seven millimetres in size. Um, so we typically use these, we, uh, we use a Liger Shaw for just about every abdominal surgery that we do. Um, we use it to take off the falciform ligament, especially in that cranial part where that little umbilical vessel runs through. Um, we use it for splenectomies and liver biopsies and just about anything to make our lives easier at the end of the day. Um, one thing I will say, probably a little bit off topic but with that falciform ligament um, and I think I'll go through it a little bit later on about taking it out but that cranial vessel there we always recommend either using cautery or ligature or even placing a, a suture around that cranial aspect of the falciform there is a little umbilical vessel there that in some dogs will continue to bleed after surgery so it's just something to be aware of I think I'll go through a bit more later 
to our assistants. Um, I definitely get, in most practices, I know when I was in general practice, it was rare for me to have an assistant um, during my, um, or any of my surgeries, alone my ex laps. Um, but I think it is, uh, I think it's an important thing for, for especially for a complicated exploratory. Um, even if it's only, even if someone's only there for five or ten minutes during the really tough bit in the middle of the surgery, I think it can make a massive difference. Sometimes for holding intestine to prevent contamination, sometimes for making sure that intestine's out of the way when you're doing something else, if you're looking at the kidneys or something further into the abdomen. Um, so I've got Justin here, who's one of our interns. I couldn't find a photo of Tina, who's our other intern, who's sitting up the back just there. Um, and these are nurses, and I think that the reason I pop, popped our nurse coordinators up there as well is a, a nurse is, is just as good sometimes as, as far as a pair of hands. So we'll, if, if the odd day that we don't have someone to scrub in on surgery, if we need someone, we'll ask our nurses to chuck on a gown and a set of gloves and give us a hand as well, and that's a, a very reasonable thing to do. Hemostatic agents. So, going to take a little bit of a sideline to like hemostasis type stuff, but not for too long. Um, basically, just want to go through how we can help with hemostasis during surgery, um, and then I'll sort of come back into the, the gel foam side of things. So, obviously, the main things that we want to do that one of the sort of principles of surgery is meticulous hemostasis. We want to make sure that our patients are not losing blood unnecessarily. Um, and ways that we can do that. So these, obviously normal ones, ligation, electrocautery, um, making sure we're watching where we're cutting and things like that. And these ones are more just, how can we augment those uh, techniques and um, help to prevent blood loss at the end of the day. Um, so reduction in blood flow to the affected area, there's lots and lots of different ways. Um, I mean, probably the main one, the one that we use the most, in, especially in general practice, would be pressure. If you've got a bleeder and you can't find it and you can't cauterize it, applying pressure is a good way to stop it. Um, I'd just be aware it does take a very long time for that clot to form. So it's probably going to take about 30 seconds for the platelets to start to adhere and it's going to take a good two to three minutes for the actual clot to form, a stable clot to form. So if you're holding pressure on something for you know, 45 to 60 seconds, it's not going to form a good enough clot and eventually the clot's going to dislodge and it may cause bleeding as well. Um, other things you can use, um, topical adrenaline is a good one, especially for like nasal cavity bleeders um, or if you're doing BOAS surgery. If we're using traders technique and just amputating the, the ALR folds, then sometimes we'll use topical adrenaline to try and stop the bleeding and it does work quite well. Um, you mentioned things that you can, they always mention using hypotension or hypoperfusion, so cold packs and things like that uh, it is an option, but again, I find in surgery, that's not really a, a, an option. Um, and the other one for sort of this reduction in blood flow would be use of, of distant control of blood flow. So whether you're either using a, a temporary clamp, like a bulldog clamp or something, away from the vessel to stop that, um, whether you're temporarily occluding the carotid arteries from auxiliary surgery or something like that, that's all ways that you can preemptively um, stop that bleeding. Antifibrinolytics, um, I think we maybe relatively um, see this quite often, I guess. Probably the most common usage for these um, is going to be for greyhounds with fibrinolytic syndrome. So tranexamic acid is a good, a good um, example. Um, we don't tend to use it too much. We, we, we do, we have had the odd patient who's had post-op bleeding. We haven't found the cause and we've started them on tranexamic acid and sometimes vitamin K as well, just to sort of cover our bases. Um, I don't know that it helps, but I'm sure in some situations it makes us feel better. Um, and then topical hemostatic agents, which is what I, I more want to go through. So your topical hemostatic agents, uh, you can break up into a few different categories. So your mechanical one, um, like, like gel foam and bone wax. These guys provide a, basically just a mechanical barrier against that blood vessel to try and uh, to try and stop the bleeding and absorb that blood. And then it also provides like a matrix for that clot to grow into and form and stabilize. Examples, exactly what I said, probably the one we use the most would be gel foam and then bone wax a second. So bone wax is very, very handy to have in clinic. Um, you won't need it until you need it, but when you do, you're gonna be in trouble without it. I think we use it a lot for um, when you're doing tikibo surgeries. Um, there's an artery close to, the, close to where you're cutting those tikibo surgeries that likes to pull back and retract into the bone after you've lacerated it. Um, and that um, bleeding from that vessel, if it's not stopped, can be fatal, so it gets a bit scary sometimes. Um, and we also use it for our um, 
vertebral surgeries if we hit the venous sinus as well, which I'm sure you're all doing tikabos and. <laughs> um, and then your active hemostatic agents. So um, thrombin's one of them, which I haven't seen used too much in um, what well, even in referral practice. Um, and alginate, which is your wound dressings, can be used to, as hemostasis as well, um, just not in body cavity, so probably not very applicable to your um, x labs. And then your sealants, um, basically this is your sort of commercially available fibrin, essentially, or you can get synthetic ones as well. I think there's lots of different types um, of these. Some of them are prohibitively expensive. Some of them are just really hard to come by or really hard to get from suppliers. If you could pick, I could, could, probably couldn't pick, if I had to pick one, you'd probably have to pick gel foam or Gelida tampons, um, which is like a porcine skin, like uh, gelatin type thing. Um, that you can basically, we use for just about all of our like liver biopsies and cholecystectomies and things like that. Um, it's, it's good for, basically good for that sort of oozing bleeding that you've got. If you've got a, a cut surface of a spleen or a liver or something, then that gel foam just gets applied to that. It absorbs the blood and sticks there and is generally pretty good. Definitely not a replacement for good hemostasis, um, but it's, it's sometimes enough. And then lastly, suction. Um, and I think suction's probably one of the more important things when it comes to x -lapse. Um So the uses that you can have for it are very wide. So obviously getting into an abdomen, if you've got a heme abdomen or a septic abdomen, then you can use it to suction that out so you have much better visualization. Um, you can also use it for, obviously for flushing, if you've got a contamination or something similar, if you're flushing the abdomen, it makes it a whole lot easier rather than having to use abdominal sponges and wringing out abdominal sponges, it's not much fun. Um, and obviously for these you can use, you can get, we've got wall units, we've got portable suction units as well. Um, and those portable suction units are really good as well for use around the clinic. You can use it in obstructive airway patients, or either BOAS patients and TIC patients and stuff like that as well. The suction tips that we have here, there's, there's a few different types of suction tips. Um, the one that's on the screen is a, a pool suction tip and that's the one that we mostly use for our abdominal surgeries. Um, so you can see the suction tip has two parts. So this is the main wand, I guess, and it's got two fenestrations in the end. And then the sheath goes over the top and it's got multiple fenestrations so that it's a lot less likely to obstruct when you stick it in the abdomen and there's mesentery sticking to everything. We definitely use that a lot with that tip taken off as well, without, well basically without the sheath. You get a lot better direct suction, um, excuse me, and you also, um, you can use it in smaller areas at the end of the day. Um, definitely find suction useful for if you're, especially if you're by yourself and you're having to do intestinal surgeries, you can use these suction tips to place sort of orally and aborally up the intestine if you're doing either enterotomies or resection and astomosis, and it just really reduces the risk of, of contamination into the rest of the abdomen. The only thing that I would warn you about is obviously if, if you place that suction tip into a bladder or intestine or, or similar sort of hollow viscous like that, it's probably going to be contaminated. You should probably get a new one before you look at flushing the rest of the abdomen with that. So the surgical approach, I don't think I need to go through too much here. I think we're all sort of comfortable with how to go through the, the, the midline. Um, I always used to roll my eyes at everyone saying this when I was in general practice, but it's important that we, we do make these holes big enough that we can see everything. So obviously the recommendation is always xiphoid to pubis, sometimes a bit longer, sometimes a bit shorter, depending on, on where you want to be within the abdomen. Um, I think that regardless of what you're doing, I feel like I, these days now I sort of understand and I feel like if we're taking a dog to surgery, whether it's for you know just a, a cystotomy or whether it's for an enterotomy, if you're causing that much trauma and going into the dog, then I feel like we should be exploring the rest of the abdomen as well. Because even if in one in 50 or 100 dogs you find a splenic mass or a liver mass or something else in there, then that's worth it because that's potentially going to save that dog's life and stop it from presenting with a heme abdomen and potentially not making it at the end of the day. Um, so that's sort of the reason. And, and I guess in most cases, an extra 20 minutes to half an hour of surgery, I mean, sometimes if your day's super busy, it's going to make a big difference. Um, but to the patient itself, the extra 20 minutes of exploring and closing, I don't think makes a big difference. Removing the falciform fats, that's what I was talking about before. We, 
always, always remove that falciform fat. Um, we find that, we've, I've definitely seen patients where it's left in there and you have to go back in because it's become necrotic or you've got steatitis in there and that's just awful. Um, sometimes you can get some really nasty peritonitis from, just from that. Um, and like I said before, we, or we would normally remove it using cautery or ligashore or something similar. I normally just use your cautery on a, a coagulation setting when you're doing it and, it and it just sort of just burns through the fat as you go through. Um, again, just be aware that that vessel or that cranial abdomen exists um, and be careful if there is bleeding from there, it can be significant sometimes. Exploring the abdomen first, if you've got a patient that's stable enough, if it's not a, <clears throat> an active bleeder or if it doesn't have a GDV or something similar that needs correction urgently, then I would normally explore first. So I know, again, back when I was a, a new grad, it was always the principle was always don't get distracted by the shiny things and I think that probably applies here. I think you want to make sure that everything else in the abdomen is okay and you're doing a thorough approach and then go to, to what you need to do. Um, specifically for male dogs, um, we will always drape the penis out. So this is, a, a, um, this is that same dog from last week, the dog with a colonic torsion that we took to surgery. Um, so you can see this dog is this dog's penis is stuck basically under the under the drape over the side. We always drape them out unless we're doing a cystotomy and we have to we need it out so that we can sort of catheterize retrograde normal grade. Um, the reason for that is if you go into the abdomen and you're exploring and mucking around with things, if you push something up against the bladder and express the bladder, you're potentially going to push contaminated urine into the abdomen, and it's not just sterile urine from the bladder, it's going to be urine that's gone through a dirty urethra, a dirty prepuce, and come out and straight back into your abdomen, and automatically that's going to make that a, a, a relatively contaminated surgery, and you're going to need to flush a lot more than you were going to have to if you didn't. Um, so we always drape that penis out unless we need it during surgery. A um, couple of other things, obviously when we're doing our X-slap, once you get to the tip of the prepuce, it needs to sort of deviate laterally, because you don't want to go through the prepuce itself. There is a very fairly large vessel, which I've very artfully marked off on here. Um, this is a, an extension or, or a sort of a, a branch of the caudal superficial epigastric, um, which is obviously a significant vessel. So always just recommend, just identify that before you incise it. And most of the time it requires ligation or cauterization of some sort. And obviously in a dog like this, that vessel, so this is the cautery tip. The cautery tip is probably Two to three millimetres wide, roughly, I think. Two. Two. Um, so that vessel is almost double what that cautery tip is. So that vessel's not going to be a good candidate for using that electric cautery on because it's just going to continue to bleed. So in that case, if you don't have a ligashore, then I'd be tying off that vessel or at the very least holding it clamped for a, and leaving it clamped for a good five to ten minutes before I took it off. There's also a little muscle on the lateral aspect of the prepuce, um, again, sort of under this region here. Um, and as we're closing the subcut layer, we'll normally place a little suture, like either a simple interrupted or a cruciate suture there as well. And that just prevents that dog from peeing laterally for the rest of its life. Uh, so getting into, the, um, getting into the surgical approach itself. So the thing that I would stress with exploratory laparotomy is making sure that you just have a systematic approach. The same as anything, the same as looking at radiographs and, and basically anything in medicine, medicine, just make sure you have a systematic approach that you can go through even on days when you're absolutely slammed and you're not really thinking straight, which happens to the best of us. Um, my approach, myself, and I have no idea where I got it from, but typically I'll divide it into three sections. So I'll have sort of roughly the cranial abdomen, I'll have sort of the mid to caudal abdomen because it's sort of got your urogenital system all together and then your intestines separately as well. I know a lot of surgeons that'll do, break it into quadrants, so you have your right lateral, um, sorry, right left and caudal cranial, sorry, I've lost my anatomy. Um, but at the end of the day, whatever works. And so there's, as long as it's systematic, as long as you're going through everything evenly and you're not missing things, then that's what's important. So I'm gonna start at the, at the front, the cranial aspect of the abdomen. Um, so I'll start with the liver, the diaphragm and the gallbladder. So again, same dog from last week because it's the only x lap that I saw this week that I could take photos of. Um, and unfortunately I don't have a sterile camera so I couldn't get too close. But always start, so I would normally start by applying my Balfours onto here. We've obviously already taken the falciform ligament away. And 
always start by assessing that diaphragm is probably the first thing that I'll do. So you do need to sort of push the liver out of the way. So again, either just putting your hands in front and either caudally, gently caudally retracting the liver, sometimes medially or laterally, depending on what lobe you're, you're looking at. Um, but you want to assess the diaphragm, see if you can see the, the three foramen that the diaphragm has, and just make sure that there's not any tears or anything weird there that, that may have been missed. Um, we've definitely seen a couple of, of patients with um, congenital diaphragmatic hernias that were undiagnosed previous to surgery that sort of go in and you wonder whether they need to be fixed, but if we're in there, we'd probably fix them because that's a problem after surgery would be in trouble. Um, the liver, and the liver is very, I mean, it's important to know your anatomy with your liver, but ensuring that you are assessing each lobe individually and making sure you're, you're assessing the whole thing. Definitely around, especially around the gallbladder, around the right medial liver, uh, liver lobes, your quadrate, your chordate lobes, it can be difficult to assess the whole lot and it's very easy to miss things. We had a liver abscess dog only, it was probably about 12 or 18 months ago, had a septic abdomen, couldn't identify the cause and even we didn't find it on the first pass. We'd checked the whole abdomen, we could not find the cause and it was hidden right in under the, like, the very base of the right medial liver lobe. So, I mean, that's an extenuating sort of circumstance but at the end of the day, just make sure you're checking the liver lobes Every time you're assessing these organs, use everything that you can. Obviously, you're, you're looking and feeling things as well. Um, sometimes these liver masses and splenic nodules and things aren't visible to the naked eye or, or just grossly. So again, running everything through your hands so that you can feel for changes in texture and all that sort of stuff is really helpful. Um, and then... Sorry, I forgot where I'm at. So gallbladder. Oh, gallbladder. So again, your gallbladder... It's on the right side of your liver, so it's relatively hard to miss. Um, most important thing with that that we look at is making sure you look at how um, turgid, I guess, it is. Um, it should be relatively flaccid in most cases. It can be full, but should be easily expressed. The ways that you can check, check sort of the patency. If, if you can visualise the common bile duct and you can gently express the gallbladder, most of the time you'll see flow, like bile flowing through the common bile duct relatively easily. If you can't see... Uh, if you can't see that bile flow, what we'll do very commonly, you can do an enterotomy so that you can visualise things, but we find more often that we will just place a, a little, like a 24, 25 gauge needle and with, uh, attached to a syringe into the duodenum about at the level of that major papilla, squeeze the gallbladder and aspirate with the syringe, and if you've got bile, then that's confirmed that the, you've got good flow there. So if you're doing any, if you're worried about anything with the gallbladder, if you've gone in there and the gallbladder is very firm and you're not convinced that there's good flow, that's a good way to check. Moving on to the mid to caudal abdomen. Um, so your kidneys and your bladder. Um, so obviously the bladder is relatively easy to check at the cranial abdomen, sorry, the caudal abdomen there. Um, there's not too much in the way to sort of put, pull the intestines and the colon cranially and you can see everything. Um, making sure we're assess assessing the bladder, feel it for any masses or nodules at all. Um, we'll always sort of flip the bladder caudally, look at the dorsal surface as well find the ureters and actually trace them up to the kidneys um, and make sure they're not obstructed or enlarged or you know, anything like that. Kidneys themselves, and I'm sure we all know how to do this because we've all done spades that have gone wrong where we need to go and find the, the, the ovarian stumps, but again, using your colonic baskets and your duodenal baskets are really helpful, so grabbing your either your sort of transverse and your descending colon, lifting that up, catching the intestines and moving them to the right side can make a big difference in visualisation. By doing that, you can almost always visualise, unless it's a super fat dog, the aorta, the vena cava, sometimes the vena cava, um, the kidney and the adrenal gland there as well on the left side. Um, the adrenals, it, it, very important to assess, obviously, that dogs can have adrenal masses. Um, sometimes they're less important than others. You know, if we worry a dog has Cushing's, we're probably not going to be taking out adrenal masses in cases like that. Um, but the left side is always, almost always visible. So you can actually see it once you do that colonic basket and move things across, you can see it sitting there, just cranking onto the kidney. The right side, again, we'd use that duodenal basket technique, so it's exactly the same, just picking up that, um, that duodenum and using it to sort of push everything to the left so that you can visualise that kidney. The right side of the abdomen's definitely a lot more a lot harder to visualise things, there's a lot more vessels, a lot more ligaments and things in there that it's going to obstruct your vision. Typically your right adrenal gland is going to be located in underneath your hepatorenal ligament, so most of the time you can't see it, and most of the time it's also not worth resecting that ligament <coughs> excuse me, to get to it. 
So we will normally just come in laterally and just palpate. And so just sort of use palpation as a guide to is it enlarged, is it symmetrical, and, and what to do about it. And then obviously your spleen. Your spleen is normally the first thing you see when you get into an abdomen. It's normally big and enlarged and right at the top there. Um, again, assess it visually, run your fingers through it, make sure there's no nodules or any, anything bleeding. If, if you do exteriorize the spleen early in the surgery, which we do most times, just make sure it is covered. So we normally cover it with just like moist swabs or something similar um, to keep it from drying out during surgery. Probably around this time is, is when, between cranial mid abdomen, I guess I'd normally <clears throat> look at entering the amental bursa as well. So the amental bursa has got some pretty important stuff, especially for um, splenectomy cases. So your amental bursa is located or well, the epiploic foramen is located in your amental bursa, which is just caudal to your stomach, the, the greater curvature of the stomach. So the way to enter it, basically just grab up a little bit of momentum, just caudal to the stomach, just make a tiny little rent and you should be able to sort of open things up and see a, a big hole through there. <clears throat> in there you'll see your cranial vena cava, so your caudal vena cava will be running through the epiploic foramen. You'll see the, the left limb of the pancreas running through there as well, which again, something we should always assess. Um, the other thing that you'll see, which is, is, is very useful, is you'll see the lymph nodes that are most of the time responsible for draining your spleen. So if you've got a splenic mass that you're worried is a hemangiosarcoma, it's never a bad idea to go, go in there and have a look. Obviously, you can have a look at your pancreas as well, but have a look for those lymph nodes because you can guarantee that if a dog's got a hemangiosarc, that those lymph nodes are going to be, if there's one in large, it's going to be in there. Um, so it can be quite useful to take those as well um, to see if this, this thing is spread, even though with a heme abdomen it probably has. Um, that's just a bit of an anatomy refresher. Um, I don't think I need to go through too much, but basically this is, so this is I look into the colon basket technique, so just pushing everything over to the side, and then visualizing your aorta, your kidney, your adrenal gland sitting in underneath under there. So the GI tract, um, so I always leave this till last, because I don't know why, I just I find it the most boring part of the surgery. Um, <laughs> I don't understand why. But basically, it, it, the most important thing about looking at the GI tract is just making sure, again, that you're running everything through your fingers. Most disease in the GI tract isn't visible, even uh, except like fine body or something similar. Um, so I always try and reach in as far as I can cranially to try and actually feel that distal esophagus, and so I can feel that um, esophageal sphincter as well and see if it's enlarged or asymmetrical and then sort of run my fingers through the stomach feel for any foreign bodies nodules that sort of stuff same thing for the pylorus and then run the intestine through my hands as well and obviously while you've got that duodenum up looking at the duodenum itself you look at the pancreas and, and assess that I know a lot of people get worried with the pancreas about causing pancreatitis but you've got to be you've got to be pretty rough to, to cause something like that so you can definitely you can run that through your fingers very gently to feel for nodules comfortably without causing a major problem. You just have to be aware that you have to be gentle, but you can still touch it. Um, your intestines um, and your colon. So I think I've got a short video roughly here. So again, same dog, <laughs> run the intestines through. So again, I normally do this at least twice during a surgery. So we'll normally run through the whole lot at, at, yeah, one, at least once or twice to feel for any disease. As I'm doing that, checking the mesentery to check for any sort of tors vessels, any, any engorged vessels, um, any enlarged lymph nodes in both the, around the colon and around the small intestinal mesentery as well. Um, so this one, I think I've got a couple of slides time, I've got a, um, a video of the, the actual enlarged bowel. I can't see it too well, which I was not happy about. Um, but yeah. So this one, so yeah, so th this is the video. So this is, so Craig here is basically about to resect the colon, so he's just sort of making some dissection to tie off the um, colonic vessels. So he's just about to use, I'm sure, hope, maybe familiar with the, the clamps, the doyen clamps that he's using. Um, it can be wonderful if you're by yourself and you need something to stop the intestine from leaking. Um, I would definitely use them with caution on any intestine that's going to be staying in the dog. Um, even though they're same as, as, I guess, debate forceps and, and those sort of less traumatic things. It doesn't mean that they're completely atraumatic. They're going to be causing damage. And if you're doing a resection and anastomosis, you want to give that intestine the best chance that it can to, to heal and to not break down at the end of the day. Um, and doing clamps, just don't, just don't do that. 
So closing the abdomen. Um, so flush if you need to. Um, it's important to be aware of when you've got a clean, clean contaminated, contaminated sort of surgery. Um, so realistically, a clean surgery is surgical incision, your asepsis has been fine, and you're not entering any hollow viscous your bladder and intestines and things like that. Your clean contaminated is entering one of those hollow viscous, but you don't have any contamination um, or any breaks in asepsis. Contaminated is obviously that, again, you've entered those, those hollow viscous and you've had some contamination, so either the intestine has leaked, urine's fallen into the abdomen or something similar, or bile for that matter. Um, or there's been a significant break in asepsis, so if someone's scratched their nose and put their hand back in the abdomen, then that's probably not ideal. And then dirty as well. I mean, dirty is basically when you've got a confirmed infection, so septic abdomen, ruptured intestine, something like that. Um, recommendations for flush these days, it depends who you talk to. Um, as to how much you need to flush. The old recommendation was uh, sort of, I think, two to 300 mils per kilo, um, which, as you can imagine, in big 40, 50 kilo dogs, becomes a lot of flush and a lot of suction and a lot of suction canisters and all sorts. Um, a lot of people will continue basically until the saline's clear, which I think is very reasonable. So if you're flushing, the, the, the biggest thing to ensure if you're going to use that method and, and any, any method at the end of the day is making sure that the flush is actually getting into the whole abdomen. So when you're pouring the flush in, make sure that you're mixing things around, making sure that you're getting underneath sort of or dorsal to the intestines and you're getting in around the bladder and especially any areas that you're worried about. Because if you're not doing that and there's a section that the flush either isn't going to or if it's, it's not being suctioned out correctly, then it's not going to make as big a difference as you need it to. Closure itself. Um, again, I don't think we need to go through this too much, um, I guess linear alba, subcut, skin, and you can use skin sutures, intradermal sutures, you can use skin staples if you want to. Um, we, <laughs> I don't, personally, I really don't like skin staples because, especially as an intern for like two or three years, I had to take out all of the staples and they're a nightmare. <laughs> Tina wants me to use staples more often, apparently. No, <laughs> <laughs> no and you definitely you don't get as good acquisition with skin staples, um, and so you can't get a nice and neat closure like Neema normally expects us to. Um, put a question mark on new kit. I think if you, are, if you are worried in any sense that you've gone into somewhere and the instruments that you have used and you're going to use to close have come into contact with any contaminated, then I would consider getting a new kit and potentially re-draping the surgery as well. Normally just over-draping. Um, we would normally, like if we, even if we've done a resection, resection anastomosis, anything that we've used in that surgery will get taken off the table, we'll get a new table drape, and we'll at least get either, literally just a pair of needle drivers, a pair of forceps and a pair of suture scissors to close the abdomen. Um, or you can just get a new stitch kit, depending on what your clinic has at the end of the day. Um, the other thing that I would normally recommend doing as well if especially if you've got any sort of contamination during surgery is flush your subcut layer before you close it we see a lot that contaminated surgeries you inevitably will get some sort of contamination touching some of the subcutaneous tissues touching the linear alba and so a lot of the time once we've closed that linear alba and it's sealed nicely then we'll flush those subcutaneous layers as well and that just prevents that infection from tracking through your surgery site and also through your suture material as well um, I had a case only recently again that was a that you could actually see when we reopened this dog because it had a wound breakdown from infection you could actually see the, the, the pus following the suture line and it was likely because we didn't flush it well enough during that subcut layer I think um, using lignocaine strips, so basically just using extra pain relief, I guess, and local pain relief with these guys is it's fairly topical in the sort of anaesthesia, among anaesthesia people at the moment. Um, we do have these lignocaine strips in, in our hospital. There's very limited data to say that they work. In people, they use them and they work quite well. Um, there are a couple of studies showing that you do get some uptake of the lignocaine and it does reach some plasma levels, but as far as causing through local anaesthesia, I think it's limited. And I think realistically, if you do want a local block of some sort, then I'd probably be doing a, a bupivacaine or a lignocaine block immediately, like a line block immediately after surgery. Um, I know that there was worry that lignocaine can cause impaired wound healing, um, which I think has been debunked in the last few years. I think they're more than happy to be using. I mean, lignocaine only lasts for about half an hour to an hour, but it works very quickly. Um, 
it'd be a bit of a game that leads to get sort of six to eight hours of um, relatively good pain, <coughs> pain relief. So that's pretty much the XLAP side of things. I think finishing with the closure. Um, and I don't think there's too much else to go through specifically for XLAPs. Does anyone have any questions at this stage? You're pretty good. Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. Absolutely, make sure they count at the start of the surgery, make sure they count at the end of the surgery, and they need to match. Try and pay attention if you drop a swab, make sure that your nurse doesn't pick it up and just chuck it straight in the bin, because that is very frustrating when you're rooting around for that one swab that you've lost, even though you know it's not in the abdomen. Um, so sorry, yes, that is a very, very important side yeah, to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just want to very quickly go through a couple of um, procedures. And these procedures are... The main reason I picked them is just because when I started in referral practice, I didn't really know about these procedures, and I, I thought they were super interesting. Um, so sorry this slide's a little bit sort of information heavy, but effectively what this is is a way to do a gastropraxy without actually going through the midline of the abdomen, um, which I think is fantastic, especially for dogs that, you know, large breed dogs coming in for a car straight. And inevitably, owners most of the time don't want to do a full midline incision to, to get your gastropraxy, because event, you know, it does have to be a quite large incision to do a, an adequate gastropraxy. Um, and there has been a, there's a, there was a study, which I've got on the next slide, that showed that doing this flank gastropraxy it results in an as strong gastropraxy as your midline approach as well. So the nuts and bolts of it, effectively we're making an incision um, just on the sort of the lateral side of the abdomen, which the next slide has a little diagram of. Um, similar to how um, we do like cattle caesareans, we're using a grid approach to get through, the, um, through all of the muscles. So a lot of this isn't incising, it's more just blunt dissection through these muscle layers. And then once you get into the peritoneum, that's probably the bit that I find the hardest is, is finding the anatomy and placing the stay sutures and making sure you are in the right place um, and making sure that you're suturing the right part of the stomach to, to the wall that you want to. Um, and then it's basically the same as an incisional gastropexy at that point. You're just making a, an incision through the first couple of layers of the stomach and then you're suturing that aspect of it into the, into the internal abdominal layer of the muscles. So again, this, di this diagram here, so that, that, that's the, the reference to the paper is just there. If you guys want that paper, I think, from what I looked at the other day, I'm fairly certain it's a free access paper. So if you Google that title, then you should be able to find it. Um, if you can't find it, or if it's not free access and I'm wrong, just send me an email and I can, can send the paper to you. Um, but it, it, it is a really good paper. It does actually, because it's a bit of a pilot study, it does actually go through the anatomy, where to make the incision, where your muscles are lying, and what to go through. Um, do you want me to leave that up for a second? Are you right? No, sorry. I thought you were taking photos. No, you're right. I'll leave it up. You're right. No, you're right. Um, and then this is another. So this is basically this is more anatomy. So this is actually suturing it into the abdominal wall. And then it's just once it's sutured into the abdominal wall, just a routine closure. So you're basically just opposing those muscle layers again and opposing the skin as you would on any, any sort of incision. Um, so I, I thought that was a pretty cool technique because for me... It just greatly reduces the morbidity of a, a gastropexy surgery, um, and it means that it's it's a, just a lot more applicable to some people. A lot of people, are, some owners are much happier us doing a tiny little incision on the side of the dog here than having to do a you know incision a few inches on the on the midline. Um, the next one, um, just an intestinal biopsy, but there's this specific technique I, I, I myself didn't learn until I got into referral practice. Um, and I thought it, for me, it made intestinal biopsies a lot less scary. Um, and so the way, that, the way that these ones are done is actually using a stay suture to hold up the piece of intestine that you want to take for biopsy. Um, so you're basically pl placing your stay suture, using that to pull it up, and then using the tension to, to cut that off with a scalpel. Um, when we place a stay suture, a couple of, I guess, a couple of tips and things that, that we do Typically, whenever we're placing a stay suture, whether it's in the stomach or intestine or bladder or, or anything at all, we normally use a little grid technique. So we'll take a bite and then take another bite perpendicular to that on the same plate, it's basically in the same area. And that basically just gives you a little bit more strength and a little bit, it's a little, bit, a little bit less likely to cut through the tissues if you put too much tension on it. Um, and again, when you're removing those stay sutures, 
always make sure that you're cutting it really close, one, at least one side very close to the tissue, so then you're not pulling potentially contaminated um, suture all the way through something. Because obviously most of the time you're going full thickness with your stay sutures, so you want to avoid how much of that suture is coming out at the other side. Um, so this one, um, the other different way that I would do these, especially with the, so I'd use a stay suture and take that off. And I normally close them transversely instead of longitudinally. Um, so effectively like this diagram is saying, like normally my biopsies wouldn't be like that. They'd probably still be oriented that way, which is fine. But I still close them in that direction. And that just means you've got a reduced chance of causing lumen narrowing in the intestine because you're going to be sort of opening it up a little bit. I don't think it, it doesn't make a difference as far as dehiscence rates. It's all gonna be the same. I think dehiscence rates for intestinal biopsies are, I think, between about 1% and 3% um, in dogs and cats, roughly. Um, so it's definitely not a benign procedure, um, but I think it's a very useful thing because most of the time intestinal disease is not grossly uh, sort of visual at the end of the day. Um, obviously, uh, you can see thickening the layers on ultrasound and, and various tumours on ultrasound and CT and things like that. Um, but if you're going into a... A, you know, a dog that you think has IBD or something like that, then this technique is really useful because it gives you a good biopsy without having to take big chunks. Um, so I think this this is just a photo, just sort of showing the way that it's done. So, so what I meant before with the stay sutures. So our stay suture would be we would take a bite through this vein, and then we would take a bite immediately exactly the same place. We would just go in a perpendicular direction. So again, just trying to get a little bit more strength on the on the stay itself. The other thing that uh, I guess to mention with intestinal surgeries, again, it doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're handling intestine for a biopsy, whether you're doing an enterotomy, whether you're doing a resection, anastomosis, or try and avoid handling that intestine with forceps at all. Like I said before, you want to give that intestine the best chance it can to heal and heal well without any dehiscence or anything. Um, so if you have to, if you absolutely have to handle the intestines with forceps, I would only, only use debakies. Um, debakies are the, the least traumatic of the forceps, but at the end of the day, anything that's going to be crushing is going to be crushing, um, and nothing's going to change that. So what, what I tend to do is use your suture as a handle. So I will normally start my enterotomy closures a little bit further than my incision. So I'm basically biting into normal intestine that hasn't been incised. I'll tie my knot then, and then just use that suture as a handle. Um, and then that way, and obviously I've normally got an assistant that's holding the intestine so that it's, um, so that it's not sort of leaking fluid into the rest of the surgery site, um, which is where it becomes helpful to even potentially have a nurse scrub in because all you need is a, a couple of pairs of hands to just hold that intestine for you while, while you're suturing. Um, the other thing that you can do with regards to what, what sort of when you're um, closing an enterotomy site is I'll typically guide, the, guide the, the loops of suture down onto the intestine to try and make sure everything's nice and square. And so as I'm after I've placed my knot and while I'm pulling it through, I like to put my needle in underneath the suture material and as I'm tightening it down, I will guide it into the right spot. Sometimes when you, if you're not guiding it correctly, you will end up with misguided suture loops and you'll end up, with, it won't be straight or it won't be quite engaging where you want it to engage. And so instead of having a nice even suture line with that, you know, three mils apart, three mils from the edge and all that, it will end up skewed and then your risk of leaking and things is increased. Um, so I tend to find that, that some, of, some of it's to look neat as well, and generally the neater it looks, the better job it's going to do. I think that's just about it. Um, so I guess just to summarise, I think I'd always, always perform a large incision. So you don't exactly have to go xiphoid to pubis every single time, but without it you'll struggle, especially to assess the cranial aspect of the liver and, and the diaphragm and all those structures there. Use your assistance if you can, um, if you've got access to another vet, even if it's just for that critical part of the surgery. If you've got a nurse that's available to help you out, that's really helpful as well. Explore everything every time, which, like I said, I always used to roll my eyes at, but it is super important. Um, and if you've got a negative x lap, take biopsies, which I hadn't mentioned previously. But I know it's very scary when you go into an x lap and you don't find anything Depending on the dog's clinical signs would guide where you biopsy. I wouldn't be afraid to biopsy intestine if you're worried. I'd, like I said before, I think probably the most silent diseases in the abdomen are going to be coming from your intestines. Um, 
if you're worried about things like intestinal lymphoma, you can always ask like do fine needle aspirates during surgery as well. Typically for most intestinal tumors, <clears throat> especially with diffuse ones, they're not super high yield with cytology, but lymphoma is. Um, and realistically, lymphoma is probably the main one that you'd worry about the high dehiscence rates if you're taking biopsies. So you can always just take a fine needle aspirate cover the abdomen up and either get someone to look at cytology or quickly scrub out and look at it and come back. Um, it may save the uh, intestinal dehiscence at the end of the day. That's my boy Walter. Any questions? Yep. Do you uh, leak test your histamine and your leak pressures? Not normally. They've shown that the, the, the leak testing uh, creates super physiological pressures at the end of the day. So if it's not a bad way to be sure, um, but if you're, if you're comfortable with your closure and you're not getting any leakage of intestinal material or, or sort of or anything within the intestine out, then leak testing may give you a false positive at the end of the day because you, 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 the pressures that you're putting on that incision site is going to be a lot higher than what the body's going to put on there. Have a good okay. with that? And definitely don't be afraid, like when, you, when you're doing that, when you're checking your intestinal site afterwards, sorry, that, what we would normally do is put, try and put some sort of like mozzie hemostat through the incision site. You can definitely pretty, pretty, be pretty rough at that point, because at the end of the day, if you, if you push the suture to the side and manage to get the mosquito hemostat through, then the seal's probably not going to be good enough. If you, may, you may be lucky and the amenter might patch that spot and it might not have any leakage, which is good. Um, but if you want to sort of do the, uh, get the best result in most cases, then then I'd definitely push that in. If you're worried, you don't need to undo everything. Just make sure that I place another simple interrupted suture on the top. Um, and the other thing to mention, I think I forgot to say, that really the difference between simple interrupted and simple continuous in intestine doesn't make a difference. To, to me, I, I typically will use a simple continuous pattern, which some people disagree with, um, but I use it. There's no data to say that it's better or worse. Um, I think at the end of the day, if, if you've got Three millimeter, three millimeter gap in the intestine or a ten millimeter gap in the intestine is going to have the same result. It's both going to leak and it's going to cause septic peritonitis, so it needs revision surgery. Any other questions? Cool. I think that's it.